Well, hey, everybody, I want to welcome you to Highlands today. It's so good for you to be here, and you are going to be blessed in a special way. Uh, we've been in this series called Becoming the Bridge, and I've had some great help uh, in the series with our teaching team. It's part of what makes Highlands such a strong church. We've got some incredible communicators. Uh, today, before I introduce who's speaking to you today, I want to encourage you. We've had about 250 folks give their life to Jesus since we... In, we entered into this pandemic phase, and we're going to ask you to consider taking your next step of baptism, and we're going to do it out at South Holston Lake, 11 o'clock next weekend. Uh, we're going to have a food truck there. We'll pay for all your food so you can come get a burger or a hot dog, and then you can take your next step of baptism. Now, a lot of you have been asking, well, how are you going to do that? We'll do it any way you want to do it. If you want it to be touchless, if you want a family member, there's nothing in the scripture that says a pastor has to baptize uh, an individual, but we're going to help you in a safe way take your next step identifying with Jesus through baptism. I hope you'll sign up for that. Just let us know you're coming. We've got everything you need. And it's going to be a great day. So if you've been coming to Highlands for a while, you obviously know Craig Barber. He's our campus pastor here at our Abney location. But for those of you that are new, that watch us on television or you're watching online today, uh, I want to introduce you to my friend, Craig Barber. Uh, Craig and I have been friends for a long, long time. He has a, just a unique gift of sharing God's Word. Uh, he comes to us from the educational background. So with all the things that are happening in our school systems today, he has a message that I think is just for this particular time that we're in. So sit back and enjoy and allow God to speak to you today as we welcome Craig Barber to share God's Word. Well, hey, good morning, guys. It is great to be with you today here at Highlands. Want to welcome all of our folks at different campuses online. Uh, those of you that are joining us on TV this morning as well. So I've got an opening question for you. Has anybody here ever heard of this guy named Peyton Manning? Peyton Manning. You ever heard of this guy? Yeah? So uh, if you've never heard of him, he's a guy that uh, he, he played quarterback at a small school down around Knoxville. I uh, don't exactly remember the name of the school, <laughs> so if you're online, don't beat me up too bad if you're a UT fan, but uh, had a very successful career there, and uh, went on into the NFL, had a great career there as well. Now he does a lot of commercials with Brad Paisley, and that's about the only time that I really see Peyton Manning, but I do want to say this, like back during his playing days... Peyton was one of the absolute best at calling what we would call in the, in the football world, calling an audible, calling an audible. And so when you're in the huddle, all of the offensive players are together, they call a play, they break the huddle, they walk up to the line of scrimmage, and when they walk up there, immediately the quarterback is trying to figure out what defense is he getting ready to run against, right? And so he looks out there so many times and then Peyton would recognize this play is never going to work. It's not going to work against the defense. It's called, it was so unexpected. So then he calls an audible. And the way that he would always signal to his teammates that an audible is being called is he would he would call out this same word, Omaha, Omaha, right? So those of you that are uh, familiar with all those NFL clips, you, you've seen Peyton do this a thousand times. Like Omaha was the signal to let his folks know we got to change again, again. We had a play called, but that play call is not going to work now. We got to change what is at hand. And so, I, you know, I thought about that because my life right now, right now, actually for the past five months, you and I, I've been calling one audible after another. I wake up in the morning, my feet hit the floor, and I feel like I need to call out Omaha, Omaha, just to let everybody know, like I'm ready for the, ex you know, the next change that is in front of us. I mean, I wonder every Tuesday and Thursday, I live here in the state of Virginia, so we're all wondering, what did the governor say today? You know, he does these announcements. He begins to prepare us for the next season of change. And I live here in Washington County, Virginia, and I, I, I recognize, hey, before we get done with worship today, there's a good chance the school board has already had another emergency meeting, 
right, to make more changes into the schedules. And it just feels like we are in a constant state of change. Well, listen, um, just about every morning at some point, I will pull up my social media contact is usually Facebook. And I pull it up for one reason. I like to wish people happy birthday. You know, it's a special day for them. I want them to know I'm thinking about them. But before I ever get to that point, one of the things I always see is this same prompt. You see it too, because I know the vast majority of, of us are engaged with, with Facebook. This is the prompt that we see. What's on your mind, Craig? What's, what's on your mind? And you know, they ask us, share with others around us who you're in community with, at least on social media, uh, what's on your mind? And my answer for <laughs> the past several months is, I'm weary. I'm weary. And, and I think, I'm not alone here. I think we're all experiencing a sustained season of, of weariness. And I wonder why. Like, why does the weariness seem to continue? The reality is, um, every generation that is in front of us today is expressing or feeling a level of weariness. I talked to our elderly population um, just recently, and, and I listened to those folks begin to express to me their weariness is because they've been, they've been socially disconnected emotionally, those folks who they had depended on interaction with and being able to just experience some life with, that has been removed from their lives for so long that right now, the one thing that they like long for more than anything else is a little bit of conversation, a little in-person conversation. And they're wondering, when is that going to happen? But right now they're weary because something that they desperately want seems to be elusive. I talk to parents, and when I talk with parents, I know that there are so many of them are dealing with, em with employment, right? Uh, some are out of work, and some are overworked, and some are just worrying about the financial future for their families, for our country, and so many of our parents are also concerned about education, like, um, how is my child going to continue to get a quality education through virtual learning? And speaking of virtual learning, I can't virtually be at work and at home when they're not in school. What will I do? I'm weary, is what I hear from parents. And like, I get that. I feel that. And then I've even got some young friends who are in their 20s, you know, who are telling me this. I'm not physically tired, Craig. Like, I'm not physically worn, but honestly... In those moments when I stop just for a second and I pause, I always feel tired. Like on the inside, I always feel worn internally. And it tells me that as a society, we're all struggling with weariness. And I wonder, you know, are these things all connected? I think that they are. And this constant state of uncertainty that we live in has yielded a weariness within us that we simply cannot shake. We're weary because we live in uncertain days. We're living in a constant state of not knowing. Um, we're living in a constant state of always changing. And this has taken a toll on us. Physically, I'm not where I was before this. Emotionally, I've ridden some roller coasters. And then spiritually, I'm just aware that there is a weariness in my soul that I'm looking this morning saying, God, only you can correct what I am experiencing. So to explore this just a little bit further today, I wanted to take a look at another time when I think there was significant change that was taking place in uh, another day. And this is back at the beginning of the church, back when the church was birthed. It's, it's called the day of Pentecost. And there was a day in which Peter was used by God to deliver a very simple call of people who were far from God to come into a relationship with Jesus. Well, this was a huge shift 
Huge shift. And this is what it looks like. In Acts chapter 2, verses 41 and 42, those who received the word, only pause, that means that salvation took place, <clears throat> were baptized. They made their faith known. And there were at it that day about 3,000 souls. So I want to stop there because that's right there. Right there is where Peyton Manning would call Omaha, Omaha, <laughs> right? Why would he do that? Because there's been significant change that has taken place. When these folks move from Judaism into Christianity, everything about their lives was going to change. And they wanted to make this public, like they were going to engage in baptism. Now, Pastor Allen already just encouraged all of us who um, have made this decision to receive Christ into our lives, to follow through in baptism. Man, August 30th, what a great opportunity for you to engage with us, right? But when I look at this day, I realize that there was a huge shift that took place in the lives that resulted in major change. Now, Jews and Gentiles would suddenly come into the same community, never been done before. Suddenly, men and women would enter into a same plane, never been done before. Suddenly, slave and free are coming together into the same community. All of this is radically new. We've never experienced life in this way. And yet, this was what God was doing as He created and birthed the church in Acts chapter 2. Now, how did they cope with that? Well, read on with me. Because the Scripture goes on and says this, and they devoted themselves, the word devoted means that they gave themselves earnestly to specific things that would develop into certainty. These are those things. The apostles' teaching, that is, that they continued to learn what Jesus had taught them and had been shared through the, the apostles. Fellowship, that's the community together. Breaking of bread, which was communion and also sharing meals and praying for one another. Those things became the certainties in a very uncertain day as the church was being birthed. So how did they cope? This is what they did. They began to order their lives around common rhythms or behaviors known throughout their new community. We're no different. Like I'm looking at the day in which you and I live and I realize in our loss of all that used to be normal, what will we now do? Like what can take place in my life that has caused me to feel so weary? I think we approach it the same way. We have to build some certainty where we have only known uncertainty. And I think if we can, and if we do this right, we can be God-centered while the world feels very off-center. So I want to speak with you today. What are some certainties that you and I can build into our lives regardless of what's going on around us? Regardless of what the governor builds into our schedules, regardless of what the school changes about our schedules, regardless of what happens with employment and all those things, what are some certainties that you and I can engage in that allow us to build certainty into an uncertain day? I want to share four things with you. Here's the first. A time to abide. A time to abide. Now that's something that you and I have some control over. Building into my life a time to abide. Now, this is first on my list. I'm going to be honest with you. It's oftentimes the first to go. It's often the first thing that begins to slide. When uncertain times come, all of a sudden we're just kind of caught looking at everything that has just changed. And suddenly I realized I'm not abiding anymore. What do I mean by abide? Well, John 15 verse 5 says this. And this is Jesus speaking. He says, I'm the vine, you're the branches. I want you to think about that illustration that Jesus shares. And he shares it for this reason. A branch needs the vine. What he's saying is you and I were created to need a relationship with Jesus. Like I, I don't operate well without him. He goes on, he says this, whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. There's a big difference in the life of one who is abiding 
with Christ than the one who doesn't. Why? Because later on it says, apart from me, you can do nothing. So you and I have this, uh, there's two radically different outcomes here. One of much fruit and one of nothing. The difference is just abiding and not abiding. What does the word abide mean? The word really means to remain present. You might write that down this morning. What Jesus saying, is saying here is, Craig, in uncertain times, here's what I want you to do. Here's a constant that I want you to build into your life. Remain present with me. And I had to stop and think, is that happening in my life? Now, I want some of you to really listen closely because I know when I ask and I try to engage in conversation with others, those that I'm doing life with, and I'll say, hey, man, tell me about where you are in remaining present with Christ right now. A lot of times I'll hear people tell me, man, I'm reading devotions, man, I'm listening to podcasts. And, and this is what I'm going to say. I think all of that is great. You know, the podcast, the devotionals, those things are great. But you're borrowing from somebody else's time when they were present with Jesus. And it doesn't satisfy the need of my soul to be present with him personally. Like, I need that time. I don't need to read or just listen to somebody else's time. I need it. And here's why. There is going to come a time in our lives when a need will arise, and when that need arises, if I've only borrowed from time that others have spent, and I've not spent any time with him myself, I'm going to be pouring from an empty cup right? And I'm thinking, that's not the place that I want to be. We live in an uncertain day. Jesus is willing to fill my cup to overflowing. And what he would say is, Craig, will you remain present with me? Now, here's how that played out. You and I, uh, many of you know that my wife and I are trying to adopt uh, two children from Columbia. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I had a conversation with with our daughter Marilyn and our son Juan, and both had expressed, man, we're, Dad, we're scared. We're a little scared, not about being adopted, but all of the new change that is in front of us. We don't know exactly how all of this is going to play out. And all of a sudden, in that moment, I remembered a passage that I had read and a way in which God had begun to fill my cup. And he said, Hey, talk to him about Joshua. Joshua had to move into a new land. And I told Joshua to be strong and courageous. And I told Joshua, I'll always be with you. And Joshua, I'm going to do some amazing things in your life through this journey. And somehow in that one moment of need, I saw Jesus begin to change the course of an entire conversation. Because it changed the hearts of our children. And I look back and I remember just how important it was that I had spent a little time in the presence of Jesus. Hey, today I'm asking you, in a, in a world of uncertainty, in a day when you're weary, when are you spending time listening to Him? Not listening to others talk about Him, but when are you taking the time to hear Him? When are you taking the time to speak to Him? When are the times that you're praying and you're engaged in the Scripture? Because those moments, those moments cannot be replaced or borrowed from others. Jesus is saying, I want your presence and I want my presence in you. Second thing I would say is this. Here's a second way that I think that we can begin to build some certainty into our lives. It's a time of renewal. A time of renewal. I need this time too. We need so much help here because we live in a hurried culture. And I look at Jesus again, and I saw this portion of scripture in Luke chapter 5. And after he just recruited his first disciples, he heals a man of leprosy. And I'm looking at what's beginning to develop. And in everything within me, I'm beginning to sense man, Jesus is building some momentum. 
Like there's a, there's a lot of a lot of action and a lot of movement forward. And I'm thinking, man, he's getting ready to drop the hammer and, and the kingdom is getting ready to come, like right here in this moment. And then all of a sudden, I read Luke chapter five. I want you to read this with me because it teaches me something about a portion of my life that needs to be addressed in verses 15 and 16. But now, even more, the report about him went abroad. Why? There's some, hey, there's some cool stuff happening around Jesus and through Jesus. And great crowds gathered to hear him and to be healed of their infirmities. Right? You see what I'm saying? Momentum is building. But he would what? He would withdraw to desolate places and pray. Like, I'm like, wait, what? <laughs> what, what does that say? He would withdraw. That was the time to hammer down, right? Not to disengage, but that's exactly what Jesus does. Why? Jesus knew. Jesus knew that we needed this example. Because you and I seldom know when to say when. We don't know. Like we constantly replace busyness with more busyness. I'm going to be honest with you. Since the pandemic, some of us don't even know when to go to bed. <laughs> and we're the adults. <laughs> you know, we're the adults. And we don't, we don't know when to turn the TV off and go to bed so that in the morning we can surge into a new day. Some of us really, in the midst of this pandemic, because every day started looking like the next day, some of us lost track of what day of the week it was. And because of that, we forgot to experience a Sabbath or a day of the week in which we are to rest and to gain some renewal. I had a conversation with a lady just recently who said, on your Sabbath, what do you try to do? I said, nothing. Like nothing, honestly. And I'm not going to feel guilty about it. Seriously, like on a day of the week you do, I honestly try to do nothing. Now there is a different day that we'll talk about before we finish this morning, but there is a day that God created when we are built to experience rest. We are not built to go nonstop. We are not built to constantly do more. There is a time in which you and I are called to detach, to disconnect because until we do, we cannot recharge or be renewed. I wonder in your life, like when does that happen? There was every reason when I read Luke chapter 5 that Jesus should have continued to press on and do more. And you got to seize the moment. I, and I hear all that in our day. But that's not what Jesus did. Jesus pulled back. And he began to teach his disciples to do the same thing. And I would ask you, like, when do you go to sleep? When do you build that into your schedule? When do you Sabbath? When do you take a day of rest? When do you turn your phone off? When do you turn off social media? When do you pull away from all of those things and allow yourself to be renewed? I, th I think that there is this need in our lives to allow God to restore us or to renew us in those moments. Well, here's the third thing that I think is also necessary in our lives. And this is some certainty that I can build into. We talked about the need to abide, the need also to renew. But I think there needs to be a priority on connection, on connection. And what I mean by connection is building into the relationships around us. I wanted to check out these words from Paul to Timothy. And I want you, you know, as I read 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, I'm going to ask you what's missing here. The passage says this. This is Paul writing to Timothy. As I remember you, you know, imagine this. As I remember this, Paul speak constantly in my prayers every night. And every day, I, as I remember your tears, I long to see you, that I may be filled with joy. And I asked what was missing, but really I should have said who. Who's missing in this verse? And Paul would say is Timothy. 
Like I think Paul can think back to that moment in which he last saw Timothy physically. And I think he sees him. He remembers all of the experiences that they had in the past, but he remembers the moment of their departure, that moment in which we say goodbye. And I will long to see you again. And, and that's the moment that I think draws Paul to tears. He remembers Timothy's. And he says, I long to see you. I think that you and I are relational creatures. Uh, we were built, we were created to experience relationship with one another. One of the things about this uncertain time that you and I have experienced is a lot of isolation. From a mask to social distancing to quarantining. All of these things have created greater and greater distance in the midst of lives that were meant to do life together. And so it was very difficult for me to read this passage and not at the same time remember my last connection with my grandpa on this side of eternity. Because it was a scene very, very similar. There were no words exchanged. He had too many tubes, but his eyes were open. And I can remember... <laughs> I can remember to this day the tears that rolled down his cheeks as he looked at me with clear eyes. And I knew what he was telling me. I love you. I long to see you and be with you. And I wish like crazy. I drove here this morning and I was just remembering those moments with my granddad. I wish I could capture one more today. Like one more today. But I can't for now. But I do know that there will come a day when my joy will be filled again. And I'll see Him. Now, for those of us who are still here in this journey called life, this is what I'm going to say. I think Paul so wanted that relationship with Timothy. Don't you? Like you're reading it. I long to see you. Like I, I want, I'm going to tell you, I mean, sometimes in everything that's going on in our lives right now, it's very difficult to find it. But I'm going to encourage you to fight for it. Like, fight for it. Fight to keep those relationships connected because they're vital to our health. And emotional connection is something that you and I desperately need. I would ask you today, who do you long to see? For you, who is it? When will you see them? Like, when, when is it going to happen? And, and how does it have to happen? Are you able to see him? Do you have to pick up the phone? Is it a virtual meeting? Whatever it is, man, don't put it off. I would say fight and press in. You're never going to regret the time that you engage in connection. Uh, it's amazing to me that we live in this time frame in which just it seems as though day after day, uh, it, it all just kind of melds together. But honestly, don't let the connections of life drift away. Build in to those relationships. Well, lastly, I want to share with you, I think there is also something that is a necessity in life, and it's a time to work. It's a time to work. Now, contrary to what some may think today, work is actually healthy. <laughs> yeah, and it's necessary in life. Um, I really believe that the Bible teaches us that able bodies and able minds are called to work if they want to eat, right? You want to eat and you can, we ought to work. Equally important though, listen to me, equally important to this concept of work is that it needs to be kept in check. Like work left unchecked will consume our lives. Both sides of that coin are revealed in this passage from Solomon. Look with me at Ecclesiastes 2, verses 22 to 24. What do people get in this life for all of their hard work and anxiety? This is what he says they get. Their days of labor are filled with pain and grief, right? So I don't know if you've experienced that from your work lately, but this is where Solomon is. Even, in their, even at night, their minds can't rest. They're still weary. They're weary. It's all meaningless. That's one side of work. So I decided there is nothing better than to enjoy food, drink, and find satisfaction in what? And work. Like I'm reading that, I'm going, 
Solomon, seriously, man, what is going on? You've given both, both sides. You're saying that work, work at times just causes great grief in your life, and at other times it yields great satisfaction. And he concludes by saying, I realized that these pleasures are all from the hand of God. Um, I can remember early on my first days as a school administrator um, walking in, and I was determined as I moved into this new job, I was still in my uh, late 20s, and I was determined I would get there before my boss and I would be there after he left. I wasn't going to let, I was going to yield to him. I will, I will outwork. I will do everything necessary to let him know that I am here to get this job done. And I remember it was several months in that he finally came over to me and he said, hey, I get what you're doing. I do. And he said, I appreciate your, your promptness. You're here before me. I appreciate your dedication. You're here after me. But this is what I'm going to tell you, Craig. If you want to be here for the long haul, you got to work the job and don't let the job work you. I, mean, I walked away from that and I thought, that is true. Now, there's been times when I've got that right, and there's been times when I've not got that right. And I think that's exactly what Solomon is saying here. And it's a message for you and I. Hey, those other three things, abiding and, and renewal and, connect, those are th and connecting with it, I think those things that we've got to build into our lives. And somehow I think when I look at work, for some of us, it's something that we need to push back on because the job's been working us, and it's consumed us and it's robbed us of the other things that are probably most valuable. So I would ask you today, when do you work? Paid work sometimes is already scheduled for you. Unpaid work, that's something that you have influence over. Find the balance that leads to satisfaction. Now, before I leave here today, why is this so important? Why is this critical? Well, I want to remind you of this. Folks this morning aren't just watching the church on Fox and online. No. Faced with the same uncertainties that you and I are faced with and feeling the same weariness that you and I feel this morning, they're watching us as the church. That's us. And they want to know, could life be different? And here's the truth that I'll leave you with. Our ways speak so much louder than our words. Our ways speak so much louder. Than... I want to go back just for a second to the early church and see what happened when people began to live a different way and not just yield a different message. Day by day, this is in Acts 2, 46 and 47, they were attending the temple together. They were breaking bread in their homes. They received their food with gladness and generous hearts. They were praising God. And then notice what happens. Because all those things had been built into the way that they lived their life, this is what happened. God caused them to have favor with all the people. Well, what happened? I didn't see that they went out and started preaching great messages, <laughs> that they started developing incredible worship services. But the way that they lived their lives created a favor in the community in which they lived. And then this is what happened. The Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Now, I, may, I realize you may not hear this every day at church, but weary people want to see people who are living a different way. More than they want to hear about how great your worship was this past Sunday. They want to see somebody live in life different more than they want to hear how clever your pastor was in his last message. That's what they really want to see. They're thinking, if your faith is real, Craig, if your faith is real, I want to see it in the way that you live. Show it to me that it can be different. And if you'll show it to me, I'll find some interest in what's happening in your life. So here's how we're going to close this morning. James and Rachel are going to sing this song called Warn. And I love the song because it captures where my heart, my soul has been lately. And I want you to listen closely to the words of the song. I want you to consider which area of your life that God gripped your heart with this morning. Was it the area of abiding? 
You've been borrowing from others' time, but you haven't been present with Jesus. Is it a time of renewal? You're not taking that time to detach. Is it a time of connecting? Is there somebody that God's gripping you with this morning that you long to be with? And it is your work. You're not in balance there. Where will you begin? And where can you get specific? How can you pray specific this morning? Listen to this song. I love that song. Let me know that redemption lives. As we close today, I just realized, man, you know, one of the things we talked about was abiding in Christ. The reality is a life in his presence begins with a life of surrender. Maybe you're here today. Maybe you're listening online and you've never surrendered your life to Christ. I encourage you to do that. Like today, 
Call out to him. Man, he's willing to save you. We're going to pray here right now. And for those of us who are gathered and you have weary and worn souls, how has God spoken to you today about building certainty in an uncertain day? Will you pray with me right now? Father, thank you for the day that you've blessed us with. Thank you for time to gather around your word, to hear those things that you want us to receive. And so, Father, thank you for helping us to remember, first and foremost, you call us into this place of being in your presence, just abiding with you, all that we need, all that we could possibly have. I think just in our hearts, a request of is found in you. And so, Lord, I pray you renew, incline our hearts towards you to want to be in your presence daily. And Father, help us to recognize the world will never enjoy or raise up a time of rest, but we need it desperately. And there are some worn souls because they have, Lord, today we've pressed into more and more and really what you're calling us to do is to take a step back. And Father, you have created many people in our lives some of which are desperate for the relationship as much as we are, connect us together. Help us to find emotional health with one another and with you. Oh Lord, we love you. And in so many ways today, in an uncertain time, it is good for us to recognize you, you are a certainty in our lives. And these days will unfold as you have already planned them. Help us, Father, to live in a way that shares the light that you have placed in our lives with others who are desperately looking and and wanting to see a different way to live. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.